Bibles, if you have them, and open to Mark chapter 13, if you would. Mark chapter 13, we're in the same passage we were in last week. Uh, I want to prepare you today to put your thinking caps on with me. Uh, and if you've got a pen or a pencil and you've got uh, something to write with, I want to encourage you to do that. There's going to be a lot more that I'm going to say today than you're going to be able to write down. Uh, and I'm not expecting that. I wouldn't even encourage you to try to. Uh, but there will be something today that God's going to poke you at. And we're going to end with Jesus' challenge on how we should face the times in which we live. Uh, we at Emmanuel, uh, sometimes when people think about eschatology or they think about last things, they think about uh, the crazy guy out on the uh, street, right? It's like a, like a trope. Uh, like a stereotype of a guy out on the street with a sandwich board, right, standing out there. The end is coming, the end is nigh, and a guy who's kind of lost his mind and he's running around warning everyone, uh, and he becomes an object of mockery in the current time. Um, we at, at, uh, at Emmanuel believe, because we believe in Jesus, that he is returning. He is returning. Matter of fact, if he isn't returning, everything that we do today is useless. It's a waste of time. Uh, because it would mean that he didn't resurrect. And if he didn't resurrect, then there's no hope. And so his, his future coming is as important as his resurrection in terms of the, the economy of God, of, of his purposes and plan. And so just as God was faithful way back at the beginning of the storyline of humanity, when Adam and Eve decided that they could walk away from God and be autonomous from him, that they could be their own standard of right or wrong, and they found out that they were created for him, to be with him, and they fell, right? And everything about them was, was affected. Their relationship was broken. Their relationship to the world was broken. They couldn't understand themselves or their way in the world. From that point in time, God said, I'm going to step in even though you don't deserve it, and I'm going to eventually crush the opposition that's against you, and I'm going to bring redemption into this world. And so from the beginning point of time, as we read the pages of the Old Testament, he said, I'm going to send a seed who's going to come and crush this opposition. And then we find out this seed is going to come through Abraham, that he's going to be a Jewish seed who's going to come. And then we find out he's going to be a prophet like Moses in Deuteronomy 18. We find out he's going to come from the tribe of Judah in Genesis 49. He's going to be from the royal tribe of Judah. So we're looking for a king. As we work our way through, we're going to find out it's going to be a Davidic king in 2 Samuel who's going to be the one through whom God is going to bring back shalom, peace, holistic flourishing that's been lost because of human rebellion against sin and that this king is not just going to right us with ourselves and right us with God. He's going to right everything. He's going to restore everything. So as we open the pages of the New Testament and the biblical storyline, everybody's waiting for where's the seed, where's the king, where's the person who's going to come, and then on the, on the scene comes Jesus. And Jesus has to recalibrate their expectations because as they've read their Old Testament, they think without reading carefully, that Jesus is going to come and immediately establish the kingdom. But thank God that that's not what he did because the king needed to come to actually make a way into the kingdom for rebels who had stood over against God. So the king says, no, 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 I have to come. If I establish the kingdom immediately, nobody's going to get in it because flesh and blood can't come into that kingdom. You've got to be transformed to get in there. Well, what has to happen for me to be transformed? Well, somebody has to take care of the offense. Somebody has to take care of the sin. Because God is just. Something has to take care of it. So God himself stepped in to take what was rightfully ours into himself so that we could have God's mercy and grace instead. So Jesus said, no, I have to suffer and die. So he goes up to the cross, not as somebody who was taken there, as a, as a victim who was just being forced by fate or time. No, he went up onto the cross to give himself, to be a ransom, to pay the price sufficient to free all the rebels from slavery. And Jesus went up, and then he said to his disciples, now you're my disciples, right? The church was founded. Dan was referring to that little uh, phrase in the song. And, and he said, now I want you to go through the ends of the earth and tell them that the king has come, that the way into the kingdom is open, but the king is coming. And when the king comes, the door to the kingdom is going to be closed, Right? There's going to be a time of vindication. God's people will be vindicated. Everything will be righted, but there will also be a day of reckoning. And so we're in a, a series where we're walking through uh, the key doctrines of the church, and we're now at the final 
uh, a set of doctrines, and that's often referred to as the area of eschatology or the area of last things or what God says about what's going to occur in the future. And so uh, we don't want to say any more than what Scripture says, but we don't want to say any less than what Scripture says. And so we're going to talk about today one passage, and it's not the only passage, but for the sake of, of our time and the sake of our ability to cover it in our sermon series, we're just going to uh, drop into the teaching of Jesus in Mark 13, but he also, we get more of his teaching in Matthew, we get his teaching in John, we get his teaching in Luke, but we're just going to stay right here in the book of Mark to cover Jesus as he looks forward into the future and, and helps orient his disciples with regards to their life in the present. And this is one of the major impulses or, 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 or um, uh, purposes of Jesus taking us to the end is not for us to linger at the end and stay there, but it's to say, given the fact that the end will be this way, then what sort of people should we be today? Okay? And that's where Jesus is going to end. So eschatology, to try to pull this out, eschatos is a Greek word that means end, Right? And logos is the word that means a discourse or, or an account of things that relate to the end. So here, the study of what God, the one from whom and through whom and to whom are all things, tells us about what will happen in the future to every individual. Okay? So the eschatology or the teaching of the end of Scripture involves what's going to happen to every human being in terms of that, but also it tells us about what's going to happen to everything. So as the Bible storyline begins with creation, it ends with new creation. Okay? So we're talking about everything because God is the one from whom everything that exists has been brought into existence, through whom everything that continues to exist is being stained by him, and for whom everything is moving toward the goal for which he's created it. Right? So we're looking at that today. Now, we're, what we're actually going to talk about in the dimension of the end-time events that Jesus lays out is something that's often referred to as the Day of the Lord. We talked last time, a couple Sundays ago, about the rapture as God's gathering, the assumption into heaven of his people prior to this time of the pouring out of his wrath. And we talked about that last time. Today, we're going to talk about this Day of the Lord, something that Paul refers to in 1 Thessalonians 1, uh, and also it's referred to throughout the scriptures, but they tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us, that's vindication's going to occur in that day, and who is going to deliver us from the coming wrath. There's going to be God's vengeance that's going to be poured out. Now, I just say one thing here before we get underway. is uh, um, Often you'll hear in the secular world, um, and often you'll hear in circles of Christendom, people who name the name of Christ in some way, um, you'll hear the idea that God is love, and God is love in such a way that there's no room for him to be a God who expresses wrath. And I just want to suggest to you that, that Scripture doesn't say God is wrath in the same way that it says God is love. It's a quality of who God is. But wrath is his love displayed against evil. It's his love displayed against evil. And so God is the God of wrath. And some people who try to pit the God of the Old Testament over against the God of the New Testament simply hasn't read their New Testament very well. Right? If you think that the God of the Old Testament was somehow this vengeful God who acted willy-nilly, well, number one, that's a poor reading of the Old Testament, if I must say that. But the other thing is, is what's very clear is that as we come to Jesus, when we think about the the uh, certainty of his coming and the certainty of God's judgment, Jesus is the one who speaks about it more than anybody in the New Testament in terms of directly in his own ministry. If you want to learn about hell, which we'll talk about in the days to come, if you want to learn about hell, you have to listen to the words of Jesus. Right? You have to listen to the words of Jesus. So you can't separate judgment from Jesus. You can't turn Jesus into this kind shepherd figure who just has children on his lap. You have to remember that Jesus is merciful, kind, but he is the judge of the living and the dead. And he's coming. And so I say this to my students at Cedarville at times, if they've grown up in the church, one of the things that happens if you've grown up in the church, when you're a little child, the people in the Sunday school are rightly telling you about Jesus, the rescuer, 
They're rightly telling you because they want you to know that, that you can come to him in mercy and grace. But you grow up in the church. Your Jesus needs to grow up to become the judge of the living and the dead. He needs to get bigger. Because as the, the famous metaphor from C.S. Lewis in his little Chronicles of Narnia, Susan stands next to Aslan and says, Aslan, you've gotten so big. No, 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 Aslan didn't get any bigger. She just got more mature. And if you've got a Jesus that's cuddly, a Jesus that's not compelling, a Jesus that doesn't wake you up and motivate you, well, then you don't have the Jesus of the Bible. We need that Jesus, right? And if he isn't sufficient for the crazy moments in which we live and for the darkest moments of life, he isn't sufficient for our Sunday school kids either. Right? So we need to stop that. So as adults, we need to embrace the, the Jesus who is the coming of the living dead. And that, that always embraces me because when it says in Scripture that he's the coming judge of the living and the dead, it means he has such comprehensive authority that he's actually going to resurrect everyone who's ever died and bring them to the judgment. It's comprehensive in terms of that. So we're going to talk about the day of the Lord and think about it clearly as believers. Now, we're in Mark, whoops, Mark 13. And we just set this up briefly last time, but he, Jesus is the one that brings up the topic, for example. Uh, the disciples are sitting there looking at the beautiful buildings of the temple, and Jesus now is in a part of his ministry where he's just gone through a lot of opposition from the Jewish religious leaders. He's getting ready to die. And interestingly enough, we get an exercise from Jesus himself that the disciples are not aware of the times in which they live. They're living in a way that's disconnected from the real time in which they live. So they're sitting over there going, wow, those are some impressive buildings, right? And Jesus is one of those guys, he just kind of craps on their day, and he says, yeah, and they're all going to be destroyed, right? If you ever had somebody do that in the middle of it, you're out there enjoying that, yeah, and everything's dying. You go, what? Right? I was just looking out at the fall. It's beautiful. Yeah, and everything's dying, and soon it'll be winter, Right? That's just what Jesus says here. And all of a sudden, the disciples are like, whoa, we're just remarking on the buildings. But what he's saying is, you're not getting the weight of this moment. Your focus is off. Okay? So he continues here and tries to get them here. And then he, they cross the Kidron Valley, and they're getting a scene. This is an archaeologist who's recreated the kind of idea of what they've seen. They see this impressive thing, one of the wonders of the ancient world. Not only the Temple Mount itself, but they're seeing the Temple itself, which by this time... At 20 years, about 20 years worth of time, Herod the Great has been spending his uh, sizable resources to beautify and adorn this temple because uh, he's building a monument to himself, but at the same time he's placating the Jews in this area to keep control of them. But it's a beautiful, impressive place. You go today and you see the stones that were cut to make the, the base of the temple are just impressive in the ancient world. So they're looking across at it, and Jesus now, uh, they ask him a question. They say here, you tell us when will these things happen? So Jesus has raised the topic of judgment. So they apparently have given some time to let it ruminate in their own souls. And now four of them are over there saying, well, Jesus, when will these things happen? And give us the sign. What's the sign? Right? So we know exactly when things are going to occur. So, and here the disciples are focusing on when it will all be over. That's all they want to know, right? When's the sign? And we were joking about this last time. Uh, that they were trying to live past the present and they were looking forward to the end and Jesus is going to spend the rest of the time telling them, no, 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 you need to understand the time that you're in and you need to know the appropriate way that you should be living now. Okay? Things are going to come. And so what we're going to find is he never actually gives them the sign. He never gives them sign. Matter of fact, he's not even going to talk about from here on out actually the temple being destroyed. He's never even going to give a picture of this taking every stone from on top of another stone and doing that. He doesn't actually get into that. Okay? So as we come there. Now, so here we went. So he wants to change their focus, right? He wants them to bring them back to the kind of life that he's calling them to live. But he wants them to live it with the certainty of what will happen in the future. So a believer, right, lives their life out with a certainty that what God has begun when he rescued you when you believed on him, what God has begun, he's going to carry it through and everything that he's promised you is going to be fulfilled. But also he wants you to know that what he's promised, a day of reckoning, is coming. So a day of vindication and reckoning is coming. And then Jesus is going to say, in light of that, well then, how should you live today? How should you live today? And that's where he wants to go. So let's work through here. And what we found 
as we talked about this passage, is he's going to do three moves. He's going to talk about life in this present moment, the moment in which we live. Then I'm going to argue here that he's going to take us to a time. I think I'm stuck here, Jared. There we go. Uh, take us to the time of tribulation, to the time of where there's this outpouring, the day of the Lord, if you will. And he's going to take us right up to the end, to the return of Christ and Christ's coming. So we want to talk about those, and we want to pull apart in particular this time called the tribulation and try to understand what Jesus is saying here. Now, this is where I'm going to actually get you to pay attention to me here as we walk our way through. I'm going to have to draw on some Old Testament texts. I'm going to have to bring some things in line here because Jesus is assuming that the uh, disciples have read their Old Testaments and they know what he means when he refers to that strange phrase, the abomination that causes desolation, okay. as we talk about that. Oh, okay. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about... Uh, uh, these issues here. So here's what I, the reason I'm prepping you is you're going to feel like today, you're, you're going to feel like today that I'm going to move too fast. You're going to feel like today I'm going to move too fast. And I'm doing that because I want to help you see the big picture. But this is all going to be recorded. You can go back if you so desire, if you can put up with me for another session, right? And if you could go back and look at that so all the things will be there if you want the information that I have so that you can look at it a little bit more closely, I'd be glad to share it with you, right? But for the sake here, I'm going to give you an overview, even though I could give you a sermon on Daniel 9, which we have in a previous series, right? But we can't do that today in terms of that. But I want to give you the picture of what he's telling the disciples here, right? So here's the movement of our passage. And you'll notice here that Jesus sets these, he gives temporal markers, right? Such things will happen, but the end is still to come. And then he moves on and said, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, right, then those will be days of distress unequaled by any. Okay, it's, a, it's a tremendous phrase here. Then, verse 24, but in those days following the distress. What distress? The one in the previous from 14 to 23. Okay? So Jesus is the one that sequences this passage, so we want to sequence it as we go. Now, so this is where we ended last week. We talked about Jesus in verses 5 through 13 is talking about what the follower of, uh, what to expect as a follower of Christ up until the end. And so he lays out a number of things here that is not a very uh, wonderful menu of what our expectations should be, okay? Um, one of the things that uh, yesterday was a beautiful opportunity right here in the auditorium, Courtney and Jonathan were married. And it was a sweet moment, uh, right, in terms of, of seeing them. They just, they just enjoy each other. There's such a sweetness in their friendship with each other. Jonathan is so kind and such a servant. It's just a, just a sweet moment that we enjoy, right? But as Pastor Van, who was the officiant yesterday, and I have to use that term for him because Pastor Van was dressed up really nice yesterday, right? Now, anybody who knows Pastor Van knows that that's just not the normal Pastor Van that you know. So I have to mark that out. That's, you got to call that. We should have a picture of him up here today. Right? But he was up there and he was dressed and ready to go and he was talking about that and talking about the idea of that marriage is not just all roses and sunshiny days. Okay, when you join two people who are broken and two people who carry their own brokenness into their marriage, well, you're going to carry difficulties and stresses. And he was emphasizing the, the ability of God to sustain us through the hard times. Well, it would be a terrible thing, right? So this is the, the Disneyfication of marriage that sets people up for uh, uh, a misapprehension, right? They lived happily ever after, okay? Well, yes, in the big picture, but that happily ever after, there were a few arguments in there. There were a few disappointments. There were a few aggravations. There were a few times where, you know, but for the grace of God, your spouse is still living, right? All those kinds of moments that you have in those moments because as you wrestle together, over that period of time, but it would be wrong and it would set people up for super disappointment if you said, hey, you know you have a good marriage if you never argue. You know you have a good marriage if the man anticipates what you want as a woman before you even know he knows you better than yourself, right? Put down the romance novel. There is no man like that, right? Or you know you've got the right woman because she's going to do everything that you want her to do, even though you've never told her that you want her to do that. She just intuitively knows that. Ah, nope, right? 
And you'll know these things are because those are all lies, and they set people up. And honestly, people come back and say, well, I never thought it was going to be this difficult. It's going to be this, this hard. I didn't know that I had to work out. I didn't know it was going to pull on my own stuff, my own selfishness so much. Okay? Well, it's to love somebody is to say, here's what you need to expect, but here's the resources that you have to face that. And I'm, t- I'm telling you by faith that for you two to hang together and to love each other through adversity is really what you deeply long for, and it's going to get to you kind of the richness that you long for. A series of honeymoons will kill you. Right? So that's what we're, we're telling. So Jesus is going to step in, and when he says, okay, here's what you expect when you're reading it, It's Jesus loving us by telling us what it's going to be so that when we're following Jesus, we don't run up to, and when we share Jesus with somebody, somebody looks at us and says, you're an idiot, or you're a threat, or you're a bigot, or you're prejudiced. We don't get surprised and go, well, wait a minute. Maybe I'm not following Jesus right. Because if I was following Jesus right, everything would go great and everybody would love me. Well, you haven't understood from Jesus the expectation. So he lays them out here, He says, what's going to be a part of this time? Well, many people are going to try to deceive you. They're going to try to make you think that salvation is found somewhere else, that your identity needs to be defined by somebody else. Uh, There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be upheaval and violence. There's going to be earthquakes and famines. The effect of the fall on the natural world is going to be evident everywhere, right? And we see it. And he says that, that you're going to find opposition from Jew and Gentile alike. So he says to the disciples, you're going to be flogged in your synagogues and you're going to be hauled up into secular courts. You're going to find opposition from the pagan world and you're going to find opposition from the Jewish world that's rejected the Messiah. Right? So now for the, for the disciples, for themselves, who are all Jews, that first part was, really? Really? You mean, you mean our families are going to reject us? You mean that our community that we've grown up with in the synagogue is going to kick us out and not only kick us out, but actually beat us and even threaten our lives? Yes. Right? So this is, this is rocking the ground underneath them. This explains why the disciples always want to skip the moment in which we live. They want to go straight to the consummated kingdom, to Jesus ruling and reigning. And Jesus has to keep saying, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute, I have to suffer and die first before I bring in the kingdom. And what they understand is, If we follow a crucified, suffering Messiah, it means that we have to be disciples who have to walk the way of the cross too. Because we don't get to go straight into rule and reign. So disciples are wrestling with that all the way through. So you're going to find opposition. And notice how it's going to penetrate right into the home. This is startling. Brother will portray brother to death. right? And then in case we missed it and we needed just one more positive statement to go out on, Right? Verse 13, everyone will hate you. Mm, amen. Right? I don't give many amens for that one. Everyone will hate you. Amen. Right? Well, the issue is, as we said last time, it's not a Christian's aspiration to be hated by anyone. That, no one wants to do that. We want to love people toward Jesus. But that doesn't mean people will receive what we see as loving toward Jesus as actually loving them. Okay? So, Basically, the idea Jesus says, if you follow me, he says this in Luke, that the disciple won't be treated any different than the master. And basically, the more you look like Jesus, the more you'll be treated like Jesus. That's what Jesus says, right? Now, on the flip side of this, though, what are we supposed to do then? So we know these things are going to happen. And he gives other things here. He just says, well, what sort of things, if, if we're living in this period of time, what does a disciple, what are our responsibilities? Well, we know what's going to happen to us. Well, what's our responsibilities? Well, we need to watch out so that we're not deceived. We're going to talk about that. A, a big part about teaching one another, grounded in the scriptures, is so that we know who God is. We know his will. We know our identity. We know where salvation is found. Why? Because there's a whole bunch of other people that are trying to present other gods to us. There's a whole bunch of other people that are trying to tell you that you only matter if you have a viral feed on some social media thing, or if you only have a body that looks like this, or if you have this amount of money. That's what makes you significant. Well, God comes back and says, no, 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 that's a deception. That's a lie, right? So we, 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 need, to, we need to be people who are watching out for deception, which means we're people who are plunging into what God has revealed about himself so that we know the real thing, right? The old analogy here is if you've got somebody 
who is uh, a bank teller, which we don't have anymore. That's like past, right, in terms of that. But the only thing, you had a bank teller if you were trying to get them to spot, right, uh, counterfeit money. You didn't give them years of treatment of trying to find every possible counterfeit piece of money and let them touch it so that they could recognize it when it came through. No, you just gave them the real thing. They studied the real thing so thoroughly that as soon as the false thing came in, they said, that's not, that's not a genuine dollar. No, that's not real. No, it's the wrong paper. No, no, the printing's wrong. The color's wrong, right? There's no thread in here, no watermark, right? And so the same idea for a Christian, we're walking, we're pushing in so close to Jesus that when somebody comes in and says, Jesus wants you to do this, we go, that's not Jesus. That's not him. He doesn't talk like that. He doesn't encourage that kind of behavior, all right? So the idea here, so we're, we're preparing that. And then he says here, no, watch out that no one deceive you. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. We're the people of God that we're going and declaring the king has come and the king is coming. And so we want to tell you about the king has come and he's opened salvation. So we're going to the nations. And so as we hear Sharon come, we're going to hear about our part and that of going to the nations through her in Togo. Today, as Karen was telling us, we're trying to go to the nations through those boxes to love people to the gospel, facilitating Samaritan's Purse and their wonderful outreach. Why? Because that's the posture of the people of God until the king comes. And then here, uh, and uh, whatever is given you at that time for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Well, we're to depend on the Spirit. We're to depend on the Spirit. And notice what Jesus doesn't say right after he previously said. He doesn't encourage them by saying, hey, you depend on the Spirit, and whenever you hold up into different places, don't worry, you'll get out unscathed. No, that's not what he says. He assumes that the disciples' major concern is whenever you get drawn up in front of a hostile crowd, the major concern of the disciple, I want to represent Jesus rightly. Don't worry, the Spirit will enable you, so depend on him, right? And then finally, right, endure. Endure, this is a time to endure. This is a time where we we face the darkness within ourselves, the darkness around us. It's a time to endure. That's the posture of the present time. So I, I often say it this way. One of my favorite little metaphors that Paul gives to Timothy is to fight the good fight. I like to think about my, my uh, life that way as a fight. But uh, I, I've described it this way as every day is a day for me to give ground or take ground in my soul for the kingdom. Every day. Right? It's not uncontested territory. Right? The evil one is after your marriage. The evil one is after your identity. The evil one is after your fruitfulness. Right? And if you think that you're just moving along through life and you're not under opposition, well, you're naive at worst and you're just foolish at best. Right? So we lean in and we endure. Now, we move on to our next section here in verses 14 to 23. And here I want to describe it as the time that that Jesus says is just before the end. Just before the end, but not the end. And so I want to refer to this as the tribulation that actually comes from a Greek term, thalipsis, which means a, a time of trial, a time of real difficulty and testing is where that comes from. But I want to describe this time as Jesus talks about it. Some key phrases, the abomination that causes desolation, this idea that whatever this hard time is going to be is just going to come at just a... A, a, a breakneck uh, uh, pace so that it's just going to just come like a flood and immediately take over. And then the idea that it's going to be a time that's unprecedented in its impact. And so Jesus uses phraseology. This has never ha happened since the creation of the world, right? That, that encompasses some big moments like the flood and various other things that have happened. This, hasn't, this surpasses anything that's ever happened before and it'll never be repeated. And then he talks about this is a time where you'll have false messiahs that will appear and they'll do things that are miraculous or look like miracles to eat to deceive those who are following God. Okay, So let's break those out here. But first, before I do that, I want to I recognize this is one of those moments where good believers, brothers and sisters of mine, disagree with the way this passage is understood. Okay, So I want to I be clear with that and I'm going to I'm going to give you the three options, and then I'm going to give you my defense in a very brief way of the option that, that we receive here at Emmanuel in terms of the leadership and how we understand it, uh, and defend that, and then try to explain this period of time from that perspective. Okay? Now, three one, 
preterist, you know, if you're in theology circles, you always have to have some words that nobody ever uses anywhere else, right? Uh, just to so sound big. But preterist is really say, when you read this passage, people who interpret this, they say that it's referring to events that have already occurred. And it's actually referring to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in A.D. 70. Okay? So Jesus' prophecy in this passage has already been fulfilled because the temple's been destroyed. And if you go back in history, that did indeed happen under the Romans. Titus marched into Jerusalem, tore apart the city, right? Those kinds of things here. And it was a dark moment in Jewish history, right? Uh, it was... Uh, uh, that was a major reversal. There was one more rebellion by the Jews in the 130s A.D., the Bar Kokhba revolt. But from that point up until 1940s, there had been no constant Jewish presence in the Holy Land for all that time. So this was a dark moment in the history of the Jews. But the preterist is going to say, well, everything you're reading about has already occurred. Okay? The dual focus, and this is one that you see at times in prophecy, where prophecy will speak of a near-term fulfillment and a long-term fulfillment. And the near-term fulfillment is something that is like the long-term fulfillment, but the near-term is just a part, if you will, or a shadow of what the long-term will be the real thing. Okay? So you can see this like in Isaiah when it talks about a child being born and then connects it to an immediate birth of a child, but also looks forward to the child being born. Okay? So that's one dual focus right here. This means that it's referring to the destruction of the temple in AD 7 and the events leading up to the end of the age. So here it's looking at the near-term event and also giving us a picture of something that's long-term, okay? even future to us. Right? So the dual focus is the both of best worlds. Right? It's the middle, middle ground. Some of it is past, some of it is future right? in terms of that. Okay? And then the final one is called the Futurist, right? Where the entire section predicts events leading up to the end of the age and the destruction of the temple in AD 70 is not in view, okay? Now, I'm going to opt for the third one, and here's my quick defense if you're trying to write it, and this is a lot more could be said here. But what we're going to see as we read this is Jesus not, does not give them the sign for the temple's destruction. Matter of fact, he doesn't speak of the, the temple being destroyed at all. He just speaks of it being defiled. We're going to come back to there. Okay? He doesn't speak of it in terms of what he said at the beginning, where every stone is going to be taken off of every other stone. He doesn't even talk about that. He just talks about how the temple is going to be defiled at some point in the future. The second thing is, when you get to verses 19 to 20, this is where Jesus says that something's going to happen in this period of time that's going to be unparalleled, that's never happened since the beginning of the creation. Something so dark, so difficult. Uh, matter of fact, that if God didn't shorten the time, no one would survive. That's what he says in verses 19 and 20. That sounds like a very grandiose, hyperbolic description of what happened in A.D. 70 doesn't seem to fit the description. It seems to be something much darker, much more thoroughgoing. And then finally, he does not answer their question, but gives them what they need to know now in light of the future. He doesn't actually tell them about how the temple, he doesn't give them the sign that the temple is going to be torn apart stone by stone. Okay? So for these reasons, I see it here as a reference a reference to a future time of judgment, the day of the Lord, the tribulation, that's going to happen. And so here's the characteristics in our passage, right? Sudden and unexpected onset, intense display of God's wrath that would completely consume everyone if it was not shortened by him. And then a central feature is the appearance of the abomination that causes desolation, right? It's one of those phrases like, what is he talking about here? Now, let's talk about that one. Okay. What is this abomination that causes desolation? Well, Jesus is drawing off of a phrase that is used repeat repeatedly in Daniel, in Daniel's prophecy, the abomination that causes desolation. And so if we try to define what's an abomination in Scripture, an abomination is some sort of idolatrous worship. Okay? And desolation is something that makes it useless, so it seems to speak of, kind of idolatrous worship that will take place in the temple that will desecrate the temple, make it useless for worship. Okay? Abomination that causes desolation. 
Now, I'm going to go to Daniel chapter 9 here to look at it with you just for a moment. Okay? So if you want to turn to Daniel 9, you can. Right? I'll give you a heads up right, to get there as you go through, go through and try to find Daniel in the back of your Old Testament. But here's, here's the issue of Daniel, and here's our passage. Right? This is Daniel chapter 9. It says, Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. Okay? Now, I understand that along with many to look at the final resolution of everything. The promises are so comprehensive and so holistic that it seems to refer to when God... God has restored and reclaimed everything with respect to Israel. The fullness of their salvation has been experienced. So he talks about 77s, which in his language is uh, a seven is a week, but it's seven uh, years instead of seven days. So a week is seven years. So 77s is 77-year periods. Okay? Okay. So as he looks at that, then he goes on to say, Know and understand this from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. There will be seven sevens and 62 sevens, right? So 69, 62 and 7, this little math lesson this morning, 62 and 7 gives you 69. 69 weeks are going to be accomplished from the time there's an edict to rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, which almost all interpreters understand that to be Jesus, until he comes. So it's a period of time. We'll look at that in a moment. It will be rebuilt and streets and a trench, but in times of trouble, after 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. Okay? So all interpreters take that as a reference to the death of Jesus. Then it moves on and say, the people of the ruler who will come, so this is the people of the ruler, not the ruler himself, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. Then, verse 27, he, referring back to the ruler who will come, will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, one seven-year period. In the middle of the seven, it's divided into three and a half year periods, in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering, and at the temple he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Okay? So Jesus is just drawing from what Daniel has said and reminds us, of course, that what Jesus is talking about is not something that was new. It's just the unfolding of the biblical storyline with Jesus giving us more information with respect to that. Okay? Now, are you ready? Here. Okay, so let's put it this way. Okay? The 69 weeks occurred from the period of the time that Artaxerxes decreed that the temple to be rebuilt until the time that Jesus came. The anointed one was put to death in verse 26, right? His death, resurrection, ascension. And then, as with prophecy so often, Daniel telescopically looks beyond events and moves from that event to the end, just in the same way that Jesus does. We'll talk about that. Actually, Mark uh, 13, 5 to 13 is that era. The 70th week is the time when there's going to be this figure who's going to come and desolate the temple. Okay? And then after that is when all of God's promises come to fruition in verse 24, to put an end to atone, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up and to anoint the most holy place. Right? So in that regard, Jesus is referring back to and drawing on this prophecy. So what we think of as the abomination that causes desolation is actually a person known as the man of lawlessness who takes a position in the temple and desolates it through idolatrous worship. Okay, So this this man is spoken of throughout Scripture, also in Daniel, but let me just give you this last passage here. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs 
and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. So that's what Jesus is talking about with the abomination that causes desolation. Right? So Jesus said this is going to be an aspect of that time where there's not only going to be a great outpouring of God's wrath, but opposition against God is going to be at its greatest height. Okay? Now, so we move on here. But thankfully, that's not the end. All right, so you have this moment, but it's going to be followed by the return of Jesus. And so here in our passage, but in those days, following that distress, following that time of, of judgment that God's going to bring out and the manifestation of that rebellion in the man of lawlessness, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the heavenly bodies will be shaken, and at that time people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Right? So God is going to accomplish his purposes, the Son of Man, which is a reference to Jesus. Right? Now, most of us, when we grew up in the church, if you talked about, well, how do you refer to Jesus? They would say, well, Jesus Christ, or Jesus our Lord, or Jesus the Son of God, right? Very seldom do we refer to Jesus as the Son of Man. As a matter of fact, when you're reading the Gospels, it's kind of weird. Jesus walks around and says, the Son of Man, the Son of Man, and you're thinking, well, what is he saying about himself? Is he just trying to say, I'm a human being? I'm the Son of a human? And you're looking at him, and I didn't think anything else, actually. Uh, and most of us don't walk around and say, I'm a son of a human, what else could you be, right? Uh, we don't say that. Well, what Jesus is using that title for, and that's why it plays here, is if you go back and read in Daniel chapter 7, the Son of Man is this God-man who God gives the keys, the Ancient of Days gives the keys to this God-man to come and establish the end-time kingdom. So Jesus is saying, I am the Son of Man. I'm the coming royal king, who's been given the keys to the end-time kingdom. I'm going to open a way to the kingdom. I'm going to go away and send my emissaries to declare that the king has come, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to, I'm going to consummate that kingdom. Right? So the Son of Man is coming, and he will consummate his rule. Now, we want to end here where Jesus does. Okay? Three things he wants to tell us at the end of this. He says, now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as the twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know the summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. You know, it's right at the cusp when you see these things happening. He says, uh, heaven and earth, uh, verse uh, uh, 30 here. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass, but my words will never pass away. Okay? I want to say the very first thing that he wants to emphasize, and I want to deal with this, this phrase in verse 30. Okay? Within the book of Mark, whenever he uses the phrase this generation, he's referring to those people who are opposed to God and his purposes. And I take Mark saying in verse 30 that People who oppose God and his purposes will be true of this age until God wraps it up. Okay? So there's going to be opposition until Christ returns. But the first thing that he wants us to know is, is that we need to understand the times in which we live. And I don't think what Jesus is telling here is he's telling us that we're looking for and we're trying to anticipate, right? Is that the sign of his coming? Is that the sign of his coming? No, Jesus has told you already that the characteristics of this age of being people who are trying to deceive you, of wars and rumors of wars and everything, that tells you that you're in the age just preceding his return. You just need to understand that you're living in those times. Right? So you shouldn't be naive about following Jesus, right? and you shouldn't be living as if he's not going to return. Right? So these are the times in which you live, and so you need to get some smelling salts, some awareness, Right? And it's going to create certain practices in your life as a Christian. One of the reasons why we gather as the people of God is we need to be constantly reminded of our identity, of who we belong to, of who God is, because we live in a world that wants to rip our identity away from us, deceive us about what really matters every day, day after day. Right? 
So if you understand the times, you're not someone who thinks you can make it through a day without prayer. You're not someone who thinks that you can make it through a day without hearing from God. You're not someone who thinks that you can go through your everyday life and not pay attention to the body of Christ and get good input from other believers. You just don't understand the times. Right? So not, we're not walking around with sandwich boards out here saying, he's coming tomorrow. I don't know when Jesus is going to come, but he's coming. He's done everything that's necessary for him to return. There's nothing waiting. He's going to come. And I want to live as a person who believes it and who's shaped by it, right? And so then Jesus says here then, right, the one thing you can know for sure is my word will not fail. His word has never failed, and this one's not going to fail either. He's going to return. Reckon with that. And I say that to you, if you're not a follower of Jesus today and you're listening to this and sounding, because you don't hear this outside of the church, right? I'm just telling you that Jesus has come. He came, he died, he was raised from the dead, he appeared to those hundreds of people to demonstrate he was alive from the dead, and people all over the world for 2,000 years have borne witness to the living reality of Christ changing their lives. And you can't explain their salvation by virtue of the fact they grew up in Christian homes or grew up in a Christian nation or that they had some sort of thing because you have Muslims, you have people from the east, the west, the north, the south, that the only thing that's in common is that they've encountered the living, resurrected Jesus. Right? And so that Jesus, just like he came, he's going to come. And if you don't know him, now's the day. You want to meet him as your risen, loving Savior, not as your coming judge. I say that to you because I love you. I pray for you to do that. So Jesus said, my words are going to happen. Then the last one, you know, this is where I get my namesake, right? I actually, I didn't know it. Maybe my, my some God's providence or something. But my name, Gregory, is just a, a verb, a Greek verb, gregoreo. So it means to watch, be alert. And that's just what he says, watch, be alert, right? So dads, it's not a time to be passive. You should be praying for the souls of your kids. Watch, be alert. It's a time when they're going to get deceived, right? Wives, it's not a time to, to, be, to go at rest. You need to be praying for your husbands. Husbands, you're praying for your wives. Brothers and sisters, we need to be praying for each other because there are voices at us all the time, and there's distressing moments, right? We're in a moment of chaos in our own culture. Wars and rumors of wars, violence, craziness, right? Underneath that is Jesus' sure word, watch. Watch. Watch out for each other. Watch out for yourself, right? Watch out for the souls of the people that you know. Stop reducing the major events to political events. The real events are, what are the states of the souls of the people that you work with? Not pol what political party do they vote for? Right? That's the key idea, right? Now, so right, it's eschatology, so you gotta have a chart. All right, so let me give you one, okay? Gotta have a chart. I would do, wouldn't wanna, you know, dash your expectations right, in terms of that, okay? So here's, here's the picture of Jesus with a little bit of Paul thrown in, right? So Jesus says, here we are in the overlap of the ages. He's come, he died, he rose, he's ascended, he initiated his kingdom, now he's sending us throughout the earth empowered by the Spirit and we're going to face persecution and natural evil and false teachers and wars and violence and family conflict and we're going to be hated by all people. And our responsibility is to be watchful against deception, to proclaim the gospel of the nations, depend on the Spirit to endure. And there's a tribulation that's coming after God rescues his people in this age. And right at the center, you can't see it very well, is just an outline of, a temp of the temple with the man of lawlessness desecrating the temple. Then there's the coming of the Son of Man when he's going to wrap up everything. But of course the emphasis right, is right here. Right, that's our emphasis. Jesus doesn't want us to keep looking backwards and forwards in a way that doesn't affect now. Right? So, are you watchful? I mean, does your... Does your prayer life, your Bible reading, the kind of fellowship you're having with your brothers and sisters, does it look like that you're 
paying attention to your soul and you're watching out for deception? Are you listening? Are you attending? Are you talking, right? And the issue here is proclaim the gospel to the nations. Man, I want to encourage you. I, I love the challenge from Karen today to get 100 out. It'd be great if we sent out 200. I don't care how many we send out. But this is one thing that we as the people of God, we should be hopping on every opportunity we get to share the gospel. That's people who live with an understanding of the times, right? And then depend on the spirit, right? I want to I listen to his voice and God speaks to us the voice of the spirit he has revealed in the scriptures. And so you need, we need to be people who are memorizing, who are studying, so that as we're interacting at school, right, as we're thinking about parenting at home, as we're interacting with our colleagues at work, right, it's the voice of God that's informing us who we are, what really matters. It's helping us to care about the right things and to not care about some things, right? So the, the work of the Spirit in there, and we're to endure, and that's the thing here, hold on. The king is coming, right? Hold on. Okay, this life is short. Eternity is long. I don't care how difficult it is. And, I, and we as the people of God, we, we should be people who are helping people endure. No, hold on. I'll hold you up. I'm holding you up in prayer. I'll be with you. I know your marriage is struggling right now. I know you're hurting. I know he's not turning toward you in the way he should. But let me hold on to you and you hold on to Jesus. Let's hold on to him together. And let's love in a way that he doesn't deserve it. Right? I know your kid is breaking your heart. But hold on. Hold on. Keep crying out. Don't give up. Don't kick him to the curb. Right? You may have to make some difficult choices, but hold on. Right? I know you're, you're struggling with an illness, right? And it looks dark and you're struggling with it. I'm trusting God that it's not by accident, that it's not wasted pain. And then ultimately he's going to restore everything. Hold on, hold on. The only way to get through it is talk to Jesus, lean in on Jesus and the people of God come around and say, we'll help you, right? Hold on, right? Don't give in to that sin of lust. I know that pornography has had a hold of you, but hold on and hold on to Jesus. He can heal you. He can change you, right? Those drugs don't have to own you. That bottle doesn't have to own you. Hold on. Let's hold on. Because the evil one wants to tell you, you got to turn to this to make it. And Jesus is saying, no, no, you turn to me to make it. Right? You turn to me to make it. And we're turning around to each other and saying, no, let's turn to Jesus together. Let's stumble toward him together. Right? God help us as his people. We pray with me as we end today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us today. Lord, we say that and it's hard for us to, to understand, Lord, how you have been so, so good. Lord, it, today maybe it's the, our physical illness that's looming in our thoughts. It's our relational struggles. It's our anxiety or depression. And Lord, we... We, we need, Lord, by your spirit to be brought into the truth that, Lord, truly you have rescued us from everything that truly threatens us. Lord, this time is, a, is, a, is, as Paul would say, over against what you have given us and over against what you will give us. Lord, it's a light and momentary affliction. God, give us the strength, Lord, by your spirit to look at life that way. Lord, so that we might hold on to you. Lord, save us from going to false saviors. Lord, restrain us. Lord, help our heart, Lord, to be wholly devoted. Lord, we want undivided hearts, Lord, toward you. Lord, we want people who, who understand the moment. Lord, it's a weighty moment. And so, Lord, may it, may it deepen our joys because when we see you at work in this moment, Lord, that's the, the deepest, most satisfying thing so that when we see people growing, we see people come to Christ, it gives us deep, deep joy and laughter that comes from the deepest parts of who we are because it's truly good. But on the other hand, Lord, we, don't, we just don't walk through this day and look at the things that are tearing apart the lives of people and we don't feel the weight of them and we're not on our knees and we're not, but for the grace of God, there go we and we're, we're calling out to you for help and strength or that we might be faithful. So Lord, help us to love each other well. Lord, give strength to the person who just feels like today that their, their knees are buckling. God, please just strengthen them today. God, please help us as a church to open our mouths 
to identify with and proclaim the King in the places where you give us influence. God, give us courage. Lord, help us, we pray. God, protect us. Lord, protect our kids. Protect husbands and wives from the deceiving voices that try to tell them who they are. That's off away from who you've made them to be and what you've called them to be. Lord, please, Lord, give us protection from the evil one. Lord, thank you for all that we have.